Front Against Censorship demo, held in Valletta on the 24th of July 2010. This newly formed pressure group mourns the death of art that is sweeping the island fortress of Malta, artistic censorship. It's a worrying trend because if we, if we, if we are going to limit the arts, we're limiting a very basic form of expression. So yes, it certainly is a very worrying trend. Malta has always had an ongoing history of censoring the arts, but in February 2009, things intensified when the Board of Film and Stage Classification really reared its ugly head. In the last year, we had controversy in the visual arts, we had controversy in literature, we had controversy in video and DJing. The smallest European state banned a British play, deeming it unfit for the Maltese audience. We submitted it to the censors and about two or three weeks before performance we were told that we couldn't perform it, that it was banned. This was a taste of things to come. The university director has filed a police uh, complaint, has filed a complaint to the police and the police uh, were looking for me to have me prosecuted for disseminating pornography and for publishing obscenity. And you think that rock music was rebellious? You just better think again. No, we, ne we never had problems with authorities. Um, uh, uh, we were quite cautious in our, in our content. You know, the, we, we know there is a certain threshold that we cannot... Um, expression is a constitutional right in Malta, artistic censorship is still in force, although during the years this shifted to classification. So no right to free expression is absolute. There is the rule which is free expression subject to a number of limitations. Now what's crucial about this rule is that the limitations need to pass a double test. And that is that the limitation has to be in the interest of a defined public interest. And not only a public interest, but that public interest has to be justifiable in a democratic society. Just when people thought that censorship was a thing of the past, Anthony Nielsen's stitching got banned for various reasons, including, amongst others, vilification of the state religion and obscene contempt for the victims of Auschwitz. The head of the censorship board was becoming increasingly uncomfortable with the liberal attitude that was being taken in terms of the choice of plays being put on. I suspect that there is a certain amount of conservatism and fear that theatre will corrupt young minds. Adrian Buckle is a theatre producer who thrives on producing new and contemporary plays for the islands. Well, our mission statement is to provide good theatre for Maltese audiences. We do so using mainly British scripts. Um, we try to in introduce new authors, new writing, new experiences. We also try to give young actors and young practitioners a chance on stage and we try to give them their break. His theatre company Unifon took the classification board to court when stitching was banned. But on the 28th of June 2010, the court ruled in favour of the classification board, claiming that it was unacceptable in a democratic society founded on the rule of law for any person to be allowed to swear in public, even in a theatre, as part of a script. I have to declare my interest. I am one of the lawyers uh, on the legal team defending uh, the client in, in, in the stitching case. I obviously don't agree with the judgment and in fact only a few days ago we have entered our appeal. I believe what's particularly worrying about the judgment over here is a number of conclusions that the judgment comes up with. The one I find perhaps the most worrying is the conclusion by the judge that because swearing is an unacceptable criminal offence, the, the, the court has essentially said that it will not be creating any distinction. It doesn't want to create a basis for discrimination between someone who swears on the bus next to you and someone who goes up on a stage and swears over there. 
I'm not a lawyer and as far as I'm concerned, the court made one fundamental error. We, our first premise was, we don't want to offer the script, we want to present the production. We are confident that if you see the production, you will understand the script. In art, in, in the performing arts especially, there is a great degree of pretense. It's not acceptable for us to go around killing people. So we direct these fears, we direct these, these emotions, we direct these thoughts into art. And we create dramas about murder, and we create dramas about horrible things. But we put them on stage because we can't go out and simply explore them in real life. So there's a distinction we have to make here between what is real life, between what is me going out in the middle of Republic Street and parading naked, and what is a life modeling class where I'm still getting naked in front of a group of people, but, but one is a pretend situation, the other is a, a real situation. And I think unless we, we appreciate this difference, then we, we, we're, going around, we're going down a very absurd way of thinking. The court is not trained to read a technical manual. The script is a technical manual. So, in all frankness, it was not his job to read the script. By actually passing a comment on the script, he is, in fact, implying that the script should be banned. Not that the play should be banned, not that the production should be banned, but that the script is banned. Now that's taking things very, very seriously. I think they got it wrong. I think they didn't understand what the case was about. I think um, they didn't understand the script. I think that we will have to fight it further um, and explore other legal ways to get it performed. The analysis was wrong on so many counts that it doesn't bear talking about because it frankly you know it would make the it would make the court look like an ass which is what the sentence is stitching was praised around the world and was given a 14 plus certification at the edinburgh festival fringe but according to the courts the maltese public was still being mistreated as the country's values could not be turned upside down in the name of freedom of expression. If we agree, and this is not just me agreeing, it's, it's a universal concept, that there are limitations to free expression, then what we have to examine is, when is this limitation justified? We cannot say that censorship always goes against free expression and is always condemnable. There are some times when it is justified. Uh, the, the real problem is defining what is this public interest and what is justifiable in this democratic society. Now the censors have the wind in their sails. They will, they will think they are more powerful. They will think that the courts are on their side. So they will probably be looking out with a more firm hand uh, for, for, for new scripts. They will try to bully young artists. Um, they will try to bully artists like me who are trying to do something different. This person knows little about the real world and thinks that by controlling what comes into Malta, then it's not going to happen. I remember when we had an argument, she said, ah, but Malta is not Europe and Malta is not England. As if cheap travel did not exist, as if the internet did not exist, as if today's youngsters are not experiencing a totally different lifestyle to the one that she knows and she teaches in sixth form because she belongs to a form of amateur theater which frankly is no longer the case in Malta she cannot read the script properly she's afraid of real emotions she's afraid of real stories her idea of Shakespeare is a oh, wonderful verse spoken beautifully and that's frightening because that's not theater that's a picture box kind of theatre. It's the sort of thing you would find on a box of chocolates. Uh, ever since the stitching cage started, we've had nude mannequins being censored. We've, we've had a, a newspaper banned from university. 
the author of, a, of, of an article, of a fictitious article, being prosecuted in court. We have all these stories now mushrooming around. We approached the chairperson of the classification board, Therese Frigieri, for her views about the issue, but she refused to give us an explanation and redirected us to the police. <laughs> In late 2009, a censorship issue once again made news. Mark Camilleri, a 22-year-old university master's student and editor of journal Irialta, published a fictional story about a promiscuous character. This didn't go down too well with the university administration. The story was in fact about a sexist and a chauvinist and a, and a very stereotypical male who uses women for sex and doesn't understand love. We are a story. Sir Asir Hafna. Um I don't know if I'm a literary person. I don't know if I'm a plot, for example, and a bit situation, and a bit character. Or my sushi, as such. But this analysis is interesting. It's a character. Character perverse. This person in the story ends up by raping his girlfriend without even realizing that he's raping his girlfriend. Character Lee, this is the same thing. Malta, Barame Malta, wherever. And I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do this. I'm not sure if I'm going to be And it was banned for, according to the director at that moment, for for discriminating against women. Hey, all right, it's not our Roger Malti Dominanti, Vera, ma famous Roger Roger Malti Dominanti, it's not our Kollo. It's not our Linea Tarare Bus Driver Dominanti. Dini, it's not our Fittizia. Allora, ma non si può dire che è tutto al Mara, anche al Lichel Caratru stess, Yait, Li, Kin, e Murmamara. Li Kin, et Sifer, apposta, bisogna che l'Istia sa fare che amelo. E di verità, Tiorina, l'Innesa, gli sta con un palo esatto. We are convinced that we are going to be able to do this. We are going to be able to do this. We are going to be able to do this. We are going to be able to do this. We are going to be able to do this. We are going to be able to do this.